Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to another Trade Justice Alliance Sunday night webinar. Tonight's topic is going to be NAFTA reboot, to do or not to do, and we are pleased to announce two internationally recognized trade policy analysts. We'll be hearing from Lori Wallach, the Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, and Ben Beachy, who is the Director of the Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Program. Now, to say the world is feeling a bit crazy these days, I think, is really an understatement. Um, but uh, I'm pretty certain that after this evening's webinar, um, well, well, I think we'll probably still be feeling a little crazy, but we'll, we will have a pretty good idea about the direction that we need to take in our struggle uh -oh. for trade that puts people in the planet first. So my name is Harriet Haywood, and I'm an organizer with People Demanding Action, and I am a coordinator with the Trade Justice Alliance Working Group. And lastly, to opt in to receive text reminders for future webinars, just text from your cell phone in all caps, WEBINAR REMINDER with no spaces, all one word, to 917-791-1131. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Lori Wallach. Lori Wallach is the Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. She is a 25-year veteran of trade battles going all the way back to the early 90s fight over NAFTA. Lori Wallach is an internationally recognized expert on trade with experience advocating domestically and in foreign parliaments. She also uh, does extensive work in trade negotiations, courts, government agencies, the media, and also in the streets. She has testified on NAFTA, on the WTO, and on numerous globalization issues before Congress. She is widely published in te television and in print media. Lori continues her work to inform the public as to the central role trade has played in the election of 2016 as well as in the current 2018 congressional elections. And we can expect the same leading up to 2020 since the public continues to demand equitable trade. Books Lori has authored on trade include The Rise and Fall of Fast Track Trade Authority, published in 2013, and Whose Trade Organization, a comprehensive guide to the WTO, published in 2004. Lori is a graduate of Wellesley College and Harvard Law School. Welcome, Lori Wallach. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for inviting me to the call, and hello to everybody. Harriet, thank you for your leadership. Um, you. We are poised on uh, a key moment in the NAFTA renegotiations that started last year, last August. I would say how to characterize the situation is uh, we're not at the end. <laughs> it's a work in progress. And to all of the activists on this call who have been fighting for trade policies that put people on the planet First, some for decades, some came in through the TPP campaign that altogether we managed to make it impossible to pass the TPP here in the U.S. Um, the, the NAFTA situation and how we engage in this process has enormous political and policy implications. Policy implications, obviously, because NAFTA is the model that sat this dreadful neoliberal job outsourcing, corporate empowerment, super attack system of trade agreements that have been replicated over and over through to the TPP, but also because the NAFTA renegotiation is happening in the context of Donald Trump having effectively seized the mantle of trade reform, cynically I would add, from progressives who have been fighting this fight since before there was a NAFTA and who have been connected internationally with their partners in other countries to win a bunch of these battles. There are a bunch of bad trade agreements that don't exist 
because of this international civil society movement of movements. And now Trump, having grabbed the voice uh, of trade reform, is using that to, as he rode right into the White House, claim for working class voters that he is the guy who's going to fix the situation. And the, the sad but honest truth is, on a bipartisan basis, presidents past, Democrats and Republicans both, have just gone along with the status quo. So the fact that this first serious rethink of U.S. trade policy since NAFTA is coming under Trump and as a result is mixed up with Trump's hateful nationalism and you know, his attacks on everything that is good is very politically difficult. But it's happening. And if we don't engage strategic, strategically, there are enormous negative political and policy consequences. The, the reality is that 25 years of NAFTA and the other agreements that followed have done real damage to a lot of Americans and a lot of communities coast to coast. And that makes trade ripe for political exploitation. So I would argue as sort of a preface to diving into where we are right now in this NAFTA process that it's never been more critical for us progressives to own the issue and to elevate real alternatives that counter both the neoliberalism of NAFTA and Trump's nationalism. And this NAFTA renegotiation process is a tricky one. As we'll see, some elements of our longstanding demands are actually being implemented. On the other hand, Trump is conflating what he's doing with all of his hatefulness and a general misunderstanding of what's the real issues. So a lot of folks on this call don't need this primer, but I figured I'd throw this slide in just to remind people of these resources. It's the effect of NAFTA. And for many people, connecting what's happened in their lives, people are working now two and three jobs, but they just haven't gotten a pay raise. They are struggling to make ends meet, and deals like NAFTA are part of the reason. It, these agreements made it easier to outsource jobs, and we're going to talk about some of the specific NAFTA provisions that did that, but you know, for folks who are who are reaching out to others, who are talking to the press, who are working to get their members of Congress in the right place. A thing to know is that at this point, just under 960,000 specific U.S. jobs have been certified as lost just to NASA, just under trade adjustment assistance. So that TIA program is an undercount. It only counts certain kinds of jobs. This contrasts with the 200,000 new jobs per year that we were promised in 1992 and 93 that NAFTA would deliver for U.S. workers in its first five years. And this is the key thing that all the message testing, the focus groups, the polling shows. When you're talking about the NAFTA job losses, talk about it as outsourcing, not offshoring, because offshore seems off the North American continent, and be sure to note that this very day, every week, more jobs are being outsourced under NAFTA. Recently, jobs going to Mexico from Boeing, GE, Nabisco, Carrier, Verizon. That database is about a year behind because that's when the government certifies it. But if you look at the trade data center, the box on the right, that's a great rich resource for not just the most recent of those TAA certifications, but you can search it by your zip code, by a congressional district, by a company, by your state. This NAFTA job loss adds to what even pro-China PNTR, permanent normal trade relations, the vote in 2000, what those economists will even admit is 3.5 million manufacturing jobs lost to China after Congress voted for China to join the WTO. The bottom line is that 60,000 U.S. manufacturing jobs have closed since NAFTA and WTO, and this has decimated the tax bases in numerous states and communities. As this production was outsourced, it wasn't just losing the factories' taxes, but also better-paid 
workers. And how that plays out is more job loss. So no money for infrastructure. So people in construction and the building trades. No money for schools and other public services. Harriet, if we can jump slides, please. So one of the other things, just as background, before we d dive into what's going on with NAFTA is, as all of you are talking to people about the effect, it's very important to make clear that even if a particular person hasn't lost their job to NAFTA or another bad trade agreement, the biggest trade effect is on lower wages. So it's a prediction of basic macroeconomic theory that when you are outsourcing higher wage jobs, the jobs that people with the same level of education who are in those manufacturing jobs, particularly people without a college degree, have available in the economy will be a lower wage job. And if you think of the macroeconomic theory, the benefits from trade are on the import side. We get cheaper stuff, so our wages go further. But the flip side is individuals lose, ostensibly, if it's working, the benefit should be we all get cheaper stuff and only some people lose their jobs. The problem is that if you lose, if you outsource enough high-wage jobs, you can actually reach a circumstance, which we have, where the impact on all of our wages, including the wages that college-educated people are getting paid, gets dragged down. So the 58% of Americans without a college degree, but as well the entire economy's wages are dragged down as we see trade shaping the jobs available in the economy. Trade doesn't affect the total number of jobs as much as things like monetary policy. But, for instance, the U.S. Department of Labor has data they update every year. It is the actual empirical data from 2017, 40% of the workers who lost manufacturing jobs that year were paid less if they found a new job, and a quarter of those lost greater than 20% of their income. That's a $7,700 pay cut for the, in 2017 for the median wage worker, which that year was $38,000. That's ginormous. So it's key to talk about the fact that you don't have to actually have lost a manufacturing job but rather all of our wages are getting pushed down. And who has now fessed up, before he passed away, some years ago, not long ago, the grandfather of macroeconomics, <laughs> Nobel Prize winning professor Paul Samuelson, the guy who got the Nobel Prize for his trade theory, basically showed mathematically that the wage losses to American workers from our trade policies now outweigh consumer gains from cheaper goods. So more recently, the Center for Economic Policy and Research applied the data and that they showed that non-college educated workers have lost what's equal to 12% of their wages, even accounting for the cheaper stuff. So that means $3,300 per year net, even accounting for cheaper available goods for the worker at the median level, not median manufacturing, but median wage, $27,000. Next slide, please. So just specifically, what about this trade system that we're currently in promotes outsourcing? And this, again, as all of you are speaking to other people, because the media obviously is severely distracted on many other urgent items, and to the extent NAFTA is being covered, it's much more the horse race, who's in, who's out, is there a deal? It's also very important that people understand that in NAFTA are specific provisions that actually promote outsourcing. And that set of rules is actually also the thing many progressives hate the most about these trade agreements besides the jobs and wage damage, and that is investor state dispute settlement. So investor state dispute settlement, Chapter 11 of NAFTA, has rights established for companies that make it cheaper and less risky to relocate. So in classic economic terms, the comparative advantage of the U.S. is we have a stable rule of law, reliable courts, and if a company is thinking about offshoring, they may have a lot cheaper wages in another country, but they don't know how they're going to get treated. They typically have to buy very expensive risk insurance. Well, NAFTA's ISDS is like risk insurance at no cost to the company, where we, the taxpayers, basically pay, or the Mexican and Canadian 
taxpayers. That's why, like, the Cato Institute, the, the libertarian group, hates ISDS and talks about it as a subsidy for outsourcing. As well as we all know, NAFTA's ISDS regime has led to dozens of attacks by corporations outside domestic courts with extraordinary special rights that have allowed them to obtain $392 million in damage after NAFTA ISDS attacks on environmental laws, health laws. And the, the range of new cases being filed constantly is in its own merit a reason that we want ISDS to go away. Next slide. Now, all of those facts and the things you sort of need as ammunition to explain to people why they, why they need to care, it also is critical to make clear, particularly to progressives, that while Trump has actually identified real problems, and by the way, unions and all of us have been talking about Democrats in Congress, have been talking about the job losses and the race to the bond and wages for the whole length of NAFTA, what Trump gets totally wrong is really the cause. He's got this xenophobic frame of Mexicans out to steal U.S. jobs as compared to the reality, which is sadly those NAFTA provisions that are outsourcing U.S. jobs and pushing down wages across the hemisphere are made in America. There were 500 official U.S. corporate advisors during the Bush 1 administration, which is when NAFTA was negotiated. Bush 1 signed it in 92. Then Clinton pushed its passage in 93. These are rules that have had a devastating effect on working people throughout North America. To the extent there is a guilty party, it is the political and corporate elite in the U.S. who have stuck it to working people side to side across the continent. And for information on the outcomes of NAFTA, both more detail on the information I shared about U.S. workers, but also what's happened in Mexico, what's happened for farmers, check out on our website the NAFTA Legacy Fact Sheet Series. You can get at tradewatch.org. That's updated data on the actual outcomes. But the, you know, the gruesome story is from Mexico. Mexican average annual wages are down in real terms since NAFTA. So Mexican manufacturing wages are less than $2 an hour. It, they are now 40% cheaper than coastal China. That's, that's a little bit of China's wages increasing, but that's a big part of Mexican wages declining. The Mexican minimum wage is now down 14% relative to what was already a not survivable wage in 1994 when NAFTA went into effect. So despite many U.S. jobs relocating to Mexico, poverty rates in, in, in Mexico, what's called food insecurity, not flat-out starvation, but insufficient food rates, have been stubbornly steady because the wages of the jobs that are going to Mexico are being so low, make it impossible to support a family. As well, 28,000 small, medium-sized Mexican Businesses were wiped out in NAFTA's first eight years alone as the NAFTA terms on the service sector allowed new access for the big box stores and they started bringing in goods from Asia instead of having the products that had been made in Mexico. And the little stores obviously got wiped out by the Walmarts and the Kmarts. The dumping of corn under NAFTA and NAFTA's requirement that Mexico change its revolution-era land reforms to allow big companies, foreign investors, to buy up prime farmland meant that an enormous number, 2 million according to the Mexican government, of Mexican peasant farmers lost their livelihoods just in the beginning of NAFTA. Not a shocker then that there was a 60% increase in migration to the U.S. by year 10 of NAFTA, Many people had no option. They lost their livelihoods, and now they're working as undocumented farm workers, are working as undocumented workers in the service sector, living in precarious conditions, made even much more dramatically worse by Trump's racist attacks on immigrants. At the same time, Canadian taxpayers have actually fucked over the most, more than a quarter billion dollars in ISDS 
claims, a disgusting tidbit I was just focusing on, was that most of the outrageous ISDS attacks on environmental and health laws are actually U.S. companies attacking Canada, and the ones that have not won but have been lodged are Canadian companies attacking the U.S. Of all of those ISDS cases, there are only three instances of Mexican companies attacking the U.S. or Canada. Next slide. So here we are with the NAFTA renegotiation. NAFTA talks with an initial notice for launch last August. The administration had to notify Congress and did of a deal by August 31st for it to be signed this year by the Mexican president with whom they negotiated it. So the new Mexican president, AMLO, takes office on December 1st. Fast Track requires a 90-day notice. So the deal had to be noticed to Congress under the Fast Track rules by the last day of August for it to be signed in the last day of November. Um, Canada has not engaged in the talk since May. Um, they came back after the U.S. and Mexico signed their deal. In the last three months of the negotiations, AMLO had a negotiator at the table. So from June on, AMLO had someone at the table also with the current administration, and he's blessed the agreement. I would note that there are plenty of things in what we understand is in the U.S.-Mexico deal that was notified to Congress around Labor Day that do not seem consistent with some of the pledges he's made, particularly with respect to small farmers. But that is what has happened. There is a U.S.-Mexico deal. It is finished. It was notified. And Canada basically was sitting out. Canada initially announced in May that they didn't want the big redo of NAFTA that was being proposed by the U.S. trade representative, a guy named Bob Lighthizer, who, yes, it sounds perverse, but has worked with many of us, including me, for decades. He actually agrees with all of us on a lot of the NAFTA problems. So Canada didn't want to get rid of ISDS, which this guy, the U.S. negotiators, insisted, they didn't want to have a sunset clause that would terminate the agreement every five years and unless the countries actively agreed to extend it. And so they offered what they called NAFTA skinny. And it was basically NAFTA plus some ISDS plus better rules of origin, trade rules and cars. Um, they seem to believe, which is wrong, that Trump can't unilaterally withdraw, et cetera, and have been doing their best to try and just pick fights over the things they don't want to do, like get rid of ISDS. Um, they finally did agree to that shortly before they left the talks in May. Now that they're back at the table, they're not fighting back on some really bad stuff we know is in the U.S.-Mexico deal, like a 10-year monopoly period for biologic medicines, which could raise medicine prices in Mexico, which has no biologics exclusivity. The U.S. law already sucks. It's 12 years of this extra monopoly for these big pharmaceutical firms. And, of course, we want to change that. We don't want to be locked in. But Mexico has zero years, so they have a lot to lose. Canada had eight years, so they have a lot to lose, and Canada's not fighting back. There are also other things relating to copyright and consumer privacy with data that Canada ostensibly cares about. It's not fighting back. So the... The next big moment that we'll all face, and it could come as soon as this Thursday, but must happen by September 30th, Sunday of next week, a week from today, is that the text must be made public, and that is again under fast track, 30 days after a deal is notified and 60 days before it can be signed, it has to be posted. So the text posting will maybe happen on Thursday, has to happen by Sunday. And the next things that happen is the International Trade Commission has to do a review. They have up to 105 days to do it. Implementing legislation needs to be submitted under this timeline with the ITC. That's likely to be, uh, I meant to say end of February. That's a typo. End of February at soonest or March. And then you would likely see a vote perhaps at the end of March, the beginning of April. But... If there is no U.S.-Canada deal, which is looking increasingly like will not happen, again, U.S. and Canada are still at it, but progress is not really being made, then who knows what the timing of the vote will be? Because what's probably going to happen is there'll have to be a new notice for new negotiations with Canada, 
wait another 90 days, do the deal, finish the deal, give another 90 days of notes before that deal can be signed, then the two pieces get stitched together, and then that goes for a vote. Something like that could be May, June, who knows. Next slide, please. So with, as we think about the NAFTA countdown, um, I just want to reiterate why it's so important that NAFTA has to be altogether replaced, what this moment we face now is. For some of us who've been fighting NAFTA since literally the NAFTA fast track fight in 1991. So everyone knows China trade has more dollar impact. It has, it's a bigger scope of trade. The job loss is bigger. But the outcome of the NAFTA renegotiation is going to set the model and the approach going forward for new trade negotiations, not just with respect for however long this crew is in charge, but it's going to set the floor for a future Democratic president that we don't, up, we don't end up with the heartbreak of another Obama and his trade representative, Froman, for instance, making ISDS worse. We'll have set a floor, and as you'll see, there's some pretty tremendous changes in ISDS, that we can fight for more improvements from that. Also, basically, NAFTA remains in place, and it's doing more damage every day throughout North America. So the one thing we cannot have at the end of this process is the status quo. We cannot have NAFTA staying in place and continue to do its damage. We obviously can't accept anything that makes things worse. The test is, will the changes actually stop some of the damage? Next slide, please. So here's where we are in the state of play. The U.S.-Mexico deal does some of the things that we progressives have demanded for decades. So probably the biggest honking deal is what happened with ISDS. Um, they eliminate all of Chapter 11B. That is ISDS in NAFTA. B is the ISDS part of Chapter 11. And they... Um, they, they have no anything extrajudicial for U.S.-Canada. So just for the U.S. and Canada, if investors have a problem with the government, they have to go to domestic courts, domestic administrative agencies. There are two new U.S.-Mexico annexes. One of them is actually almost exactly the model that is an ISDS battler for decades, I would say is the thing we would want, which is it replaces the ISDS procedures with fixes we've long demanded, and it whacks all of those extreme ISDS rights. So the right to invest, the right, for instance, in that horrible Bill Con mining NAFTA case where you have a right to get a permit and open a new mine, it gets rid of the, what's called the minimum standard of treatment. That's an MST in the slide, or FET, fair and equitable treatment. Those are those huge elastic grab-all standards under which companies say, ah, you change the regulatory climate. I am now having an unexpected change to my circumstances. This is not allowed. It gets rid of what's called indirect expropriation or regulatory takings, where if a regulation lessens the value of your investment, for instance, the Clean Air Act improvements would, that we hope for in the future would require an investment in better smokestack scrubbers. You can't get money from the government. That's the cost of doing business. But NAFTA lets compensation happen for things like that. The transfer standard is a financial services issue. It guarantees free flow of capital no matter if there's a crisis. If there's a financial crisis, you still can move your money. Anything that limits free flows and speculation is a violation of NAFTA. And the performance requirement standard, also whacked, is the rule that allows compensation for things like what a Canadian province did to ExxonMobil and every other company, U.S., Canadian, or Martian, who had a contract to explore for oil offshore, which is require they all put some small share of what they earned into a fund for research and development on how to deal with oil spills, and for worker safety training. So those outrageous broad standards are gone. And with respect only to Mexico, the new system is there is no outside review unless and until an investor has, has used the domestic processes to try and resolve a problem with the government. 
and has either done so, it's called exhausting domestic remedies in international law, or they've spent 30 months trying. If they have done that, they then qualify for a review under the new procedures. The new procedures do not allow lawyers to rotate between deciding cases and representing corporations suing governments in the system. They forbid what are called inherently speculative damages, the future expected profits, I'm going to make up a number, I hope someday I'll make this much money on this investment. They make the burden on the, on the investor to prove what the actual damages are. And that system, they could only bring claims for direct expropriation, which is defined literally as the government takes the title of your property or fully occupies it. It's a very narrow definition. And post-establishment discrimination. So no right to invest, but if you're in and then you get picked on, as a foreign investor, and you can't get it sorted out in the 30 months, you can have a review on that issue. That's all the great news. The bad news is there is an oil gas annex. There is a second annex. Up until now, it's the ideal outcome. This new annex, oil gas, carves in broader rights for the seven U.S. oil and gas companies that in the last three years have gotten contracts during the partial privatization of the oil and gas sector by the current government. That's the thing that Amal is saying is going to reverse. And this oil gas annex lets those companies, they have 13 contracts, it's quite narrow, that allows them to use the new process but the broader rights so that if their contracts get canceled, they can, claim, they can make claims and get the money back. That is not something I like. It may be the price we pay for what is an otherwise amazing outcome on investor state. Uh, not surprisingly, the Business Roundtable, the Wall Street Journal, the American Enterprise Institute are all on the war path about the rust of what happened to ISDS. And um, they've got a lot of Republicans very wound up in Congress about this tremendous change. So back up just if we can go back up just one, I want to flag something on the top of that slide, Harriet. So the other sure. thing I have here about cutting NAFTA terms that promote the outsourcing of American jobs. So the good news is the U.S.-Mexico agreement has probably the strongest labor rights chapter of any trade agreement to date, but, and it's a but of enormous proportions. These new terms are not yet subject to sufficient enforcement. And I'm going to describe more of that. But if we don't see much better, really swift and certain enforcement, then the lack of real labor rights in Mexico and the average declining wages is going to continue to be an enormous pull factor in American U.S. job outsourcing and a continuing hardship for workers in Mexico. Now, Harriet, please. So other good things that are going to be in this U.S.-Mexico tax the agreement closed what is a loophole that has always been there that allowed a lot of Chinese-made content to get the NAFTA duty-free treatment. The old rule for cars was 62.5% of North American content qualified as NAFTA. The new level is 75%. And the most interesting, hopeful, we have to see the language, but fairly stunning thing is the U.S., um, this guy Lighthizer insisted on a new rule that has a wage standard. It's the first wage standard in a rule of origin of trade agreement. It is 45% of the value of an assembled auto and 40% of the value of auto parts must be made by workers earning $16 an hour or more. Now, again, we need to see how the language is written, but the idea here is both to create an incentive to raise wages in Mexico, but also to ensure that that larger share of North American content also creates jobs in the U.S. and Canada. Another big gain, an environmental one, is that the U.S.-Mexico deal, and this is something Canada wanted and got before they walked out, <laughs> it eliminates NAFTA's what's called proportional sharing rules. These are outrageous rules that require the export of natural resources based on the level of exports over the previous three years. And it didn't matter if you, say, you know, ban tar sands oil extraction or you decide to conserve water. 
basically once once the export started, you were forced to export even if you shut it down domestically. And it was in a, a variety of different parts of NAFTA. Um, NAFTA's energy chapter is altogether gone. There was a special set of privileges for energy. It was in there, but it was also another part of NAFTA, and that is gone. Now, the final thing that's in the sort of good category, but it's light green, is the sunset. We very strongly support having a five-year sunset, where after five years, you either affirmatively extend the agreement or you shut it down. And that was one of the things Canada walked out on, and Mexico wouldn't accept it either. And it's now way watered down. Instead of every five years, there is a review in six years on a term of an agreement. Now, just to put this in perspective, NAFTA is now endless, so there is no end to NAFTA. So now the agreement has a 16-year term, and there's a six-year review along the way. And if at the six-year review there is a problem, you still have to wait for the other years to go along. At the end of the 16 years, it sunsets unless, unless extended. That is a, it's better than the status quo, but it's, you know, it's not what we all had hoped for, which was a really dramatic accountability uh, imposition on the process. Next slide, please. So here are the things that are still in process. The labor chapter is um, interesting according to our friends in labor because it fixes some of the problems in the actual text of the chapter that have led to previous efforts to enforce those chapters to fail. And it adds some new language on violence against workers and, and other issues that have always been lacking. However, Perhaps the most interesting thing is a special U.S.-Mexico annex that's attached to the labor chapter, and it requires that Mexico effectively implement in domestic law its constitutional labor reforms, which it has not, which Mexico agreed to do as a condition for TPP, which it still hasn't made these changes. The way it works in Mexico is the Constitution requires every private workplace has to have a union, and a lot of corrupt union federations have set up businesses where they'll go make sure the company meets that standard for a fee. But what they do is before the first worker walks in the door, they create and register a union and they sign a contract for crap wages and horrible conditions. And when a worker comes in and realizes they're being paid a buck fifty an hour and goes on strike, they're beaten up, fired, thrown in jail for violating <clears throat> their contract for a union they didn't know they had for a contract they never agreed to. So the new obligation in this annex is for Mexico to have secret ballot elections of the workers for their contracts and for their unions with a process to be able to get rid of those fake unions with a relatively small percentage of workers signing a form and all of the existing prote protection contracts have to be re-voted and replaced in four years. That's amazing, huh? But, but but the enforcement is not yet there. So that chapter is enforceable and the annex is enforceable if one country wants to sue another country, just regular old dispute settlement. But as we've seen, the countries never enforce these parts of the agreements. So what our friends in labor have been advocating for is some mechanism that ensures that if a government doesn't take a case to enforce, then the workers in the countries can do something. So um, the... There are some creative ideas. They're probably going to end up in the implementing legislation, which is one of the reasons this is really a work in progress. The labor folks I know were meeting with the trade representatives, number two guy, number one guy in NAFTA, number two guy in the place last week, trying to figure out how you create a system so that if these rules are not being enforced, you don't have to rely on the governments. You actually can figure out some way to create a penalty that is initiated by the workers. Um, that is really key, and if that doesn't get fixed, I don't think you'll see really almost any Democrats, except maybe that scandalous bunch that supported TPP, of which there are a few dozen, who would see this as a deal that would stop the damage. That is necessary, that better enforcement to stop the damage. So that is one of those outstanding things we need to keep an eye on. And every time I've sort of been at wit's end and been ready to scream about this or that problem in the 
U.S.-Mexico deal, I remind myself that this would make a transformational difference for workers in Mexico particularly, and that the unions in the U.S. who've worked with their Mexican counterparts to get this whole annex set up basically need to play out the course of their negotiations to see if they can make it enforceable, and we'll know. We'll know when we hear from them if they did that. If they did, it's going to be something. If they don't, well, then the NAFTA damage is going to continue unabated. Next slide, please. Here are the things we know are bad. So red slide, we had the green, we had the blue, and now we have the red. So these are things we know are problematic. We will know more about how problematic that they are. But we know these were things where, although the USTR, Bob Lighthizer, dislikes passionately ISDS, basically was willing to die in a ditch over the higher rule of origin and the wage standard, was the guy who prioritized that U.S.-Mexico annex and got that locked in before making other deals, other parts of the agreement. His view and that of his counterparts in, in the U.S. Trade Representative's Office are just the opposite of ours, of progressives, on these issues. And as well as the things we know, there could be bad surprises once we see the final text. So we know it's going to be bad on access to affordable medicine. The U.S. has this 12-year exclusivity for biologic drugs. It just means it's a period where, even if there wasn't a patent, only the company that has the, the, the exclusivity can sell the drug. And these are the medicines that you know, people take for rheumatoid arthritis, for Crohn's disease, the cutting-edge cancer drugs that are $100,000 a year. These are the injectables. It's bad for the U.S. to lock that in, obviously. AARP was up in the Hill doing a briefing two weeks ago saying that's dreadful, that can't stay in the final deal, but also it's really even worse for Canada and Mexico. There are provisions that we know are going to be undermining of consumer privacy, like free data flows, rules, or e-commerce things. Undoubtedly, we're not going to like um, a bunch of it is, frankly, going to represent U.S. law, which sucks. <laughs> U.S. law in this area is really bad, and so we're going to, in NAFTA, see language that would lock us into that badness and export it. That's not good. On food safety, we know there's going to be bad stuff. Now, folks saw that outrageous junk food labeling annex that would have banned junk food labeling. We know that's out, but there are going to be other bad things on food inspection, on labels, maybe on GMOs, almost certainly on GMOs. Our demand here was just a real simple one, all imported food should meet U.S. standards. The old NAFTA broke that standard. It allows food to come in that doesn't meet U.S. standards. This does not fix it, and almost certainly it will make it worse, as every trade agreement since NAFTA has gotten worse and worse and worse on this issue. Next slide, please. So what are the end game scenarios? Um, we are going to look at this text on... Thursday or whenever it comes out. We've got sort of a, a, a plan to zoom through pieces of it to try and figure out what actually is in there. If the good stuff we have a very good sense is in there really is as written. If the bad stuff we're worried about is bad and what else is in there that we didn't know about. And some of the language that will make a difference on stuff like the $16 wage rule. But when we look at it, and this is public citizens' take, and we've done a lot of soul searching about this because, you know, we're the organization that's hated NAFTA since before there was NAFTA. Our take is basically, does it, does a new deal, and we're not going to know, by the way, when this text comes out because the implementing bill is going to decide whether or not the labor stops enforceable, but does the final, the final package, is it going to meet our longstanding criteria for things that, need to be fixed so that the serious ongoing damage could be stopped. So like getting rid of ISDS or getting rid of the Buy Local, Buy America ban, which, by the way, there are numerous versions of what the text is going to say on that. I actually don't know, and I know what a lot of the text says, so we don't know what's going to happen on the procurement stuff. Are we going to get real labor standards? If yes, the changes could stop the ongoing damage, it's our take that – we have to harvest those changes because they would make a real difference in the lives of a lot of people, not just here but also in Mexico and Canada. And that could be hard 
because, of course, we will all have to resist our reflexive anti-Trump position that anything that comes out of this administration must be reacted to like Dracula feels about garlic and holy water. It could come to pass, though, largely through the fluky reality of Robert Lighthizer being the trade representative, that actually these NAFTA changes, and again, it's a work in progress. We are not going to know until we know what happens in the implementing bill on labor enforcement. And again, there could be horrible skunk, rabid skunk surprises in there. But if, in fact, it would make a real difference, then we have to harvest that. We have to do that for a while, mean for people's lives, but also we need to lay in the floor from which the fight will continue. And basically, the realization we've come to is that is the case even if there are things in there that we don't like. So one of the standards that we have put forward is, are there places where it's going to change U.S. law and make U.S. law worse? So on the food safety, it may be terrible, but we're looking and we'll work with partners to figure out, okay, are there places in there that actually makes the current system, which in the U.S. is a mess, (laughs) needs to be improved? Is it going to make it even worse? But we're in a different situation here than we are we were with TPP. TPP was a blank slate. So no on TPP meant no on a bad agreement. But if we have a NAFTA replacement deal that could stop some of the ongoing damage, then we should harvest that. And then, of course, if there are overwhelming bad new things, then that's a counterforce to the notion of the upside of some of the damage being stopped. But that's the test for us. It's not a blank slate test. It's a, would this make a difference to actually people's lives and as well to setting the model from which we could fight forward. Next slide, please. So our bottom line is not just can't the NAFTA damage continue for people's lives, but how we all react to this is a political matter as well. So Trump won election in part by calling out the ruin caused by our trade agreements. And he cannot be allowed to own the mantle of trade reform. So the two questions are, one, can we jujitsu some real change out of these NAFTA renegotiations? A thing that's only possible because of this Bob Lighthizer, who, by the way, has worked with the unions. <laughs> for decades, not just me. So is that possible? But even if it is, we need to characterize what we may find to be real improvements in the context of continually holding Trump accountable for what is not changing. And if you are not already on signed up for the activist list on www.replacenafta.org or public citizens activist list, Global Trade Watches, at tradewatch.org, sign up. Because we send out, and, and like us on Facebook, connect to us on Facebook, we send out graphics like this, four or five of them a day. So this just shows how Trump, for all of his bragging that he would quickly get rid of the trade deficit, in his first two years, the trade deficit just kept growing up, 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 higher than the last year of President Obama, second part, you know, so far this year is higher than last year. So this is the kind of accountability stuff we need to be continuing to put out there as we also lay out what could be better about this NAFTA, but what still doesn't cut it. Next slide, please. Basically, we need to make sure people don't understand that the answer to what are real and severe problems from the trade status quo are either a reversion back to TPP NAFTA And we know there are prominent Democrats who will say that. There are prominent Democrats who still support TPP. There are certainly many businesses that will attack the things we like about the changes in the NAFTA renegotiation and try and conflate general Trump is a hateful lunatic with whatever comes out of NAFTA renegotiations. And we're seeing the effect of that in the polling. So this is painful for everyone on this call to hear because you've done so much of the organizing work. 
But the polling shows that people who identify as Democrats are increasingly pro-NAFTA and pro-TPP simply because Uh. Trump's on the other side. This, my friends, could undo 25 years of all of our work together. We cannot let reflexive anti-Trumpism make it seem that neoliberalism is a better answer. And that is certainly a trap and a trick that the same Democrats we've been fighting on these issues and the same companies are very keen to line up. As well, obviously, when we talk about what may be real changes, if in the end we think the agreement that comes out is worth trying to implement and we fight for it, it must be in the context of laying out the real story that counters Trump's nationalism that this wasn't Mexicans screwing us through NAFTA, that this is a corporate attack on North American workers and the North American environment, that what is in the replace NAFTA, if it actually gets the labor enforcement, if it meets the stops real damage test, that that is not the end of the story. That is not the agreement we would have if we were writing one from scratch, but rather these are important pieces of progress some of them tremendous pieces of progress, from which we expect further building, and we reiterate everything that is wrong with the deal, whether or not we support it or we oppose it, which is to say, as I've been working on, some of the materials we'll be having to release next year. Sorry, Freudian slip. Next week, seems like a year of working (laughs) on them over the weekend. Next week, when the text comes out, I am lining out all the things I think they're not going to cut it on, like the food safety, like the access to medicines. Because going forward, we need to set the predicate, even if we decide that this change would fix some of the ongoing damage, we still need to keep pushing for the kind of agreement we really, really want. We cannot let Trump communicate that he has fixed everything on trade, even if it is the case the renegotiated NAFTA fixes some of these key problems, and we want to harvest that and build forward. I think there's one more slide. Oh, that's it. Yes, that, that was really terrific, Lori. Um, okay, I know, um, I know with all that information, uh, everybody's head is exploding, but uh, I'm sure there must be some questions, so please press star six on your phone. And uh, and when you hear the uh, when you're prompted, press one, and Carrie will open your line for you. That was really terrific. So much, uh, so much tied up in this, and it it is really difficult right now to um, see what's happening. Uh, it's really hard to get people to want to get back in the fight against bad trade deals. It's been my experience. Okay, star six. Carrie, how are we doing? Hi. Um, one of the uh, – it's been said that maybe the can next big can bubble – Can you introduce yourself and say where you're com- – your, your, your I'm sorry. This is Paul Flansbury. I'm calling from Rochester, New York. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Yep. Okay. Hi. And um, uh, it's been said that maybe the next big bubble is education debt. A lot of students are taking a lot of loans out. Uh, in order to um, go to college, and then, of course, it's only their wages that are going to pay for them. Given that uh, reality, um, how might that intersect with uh, negotiations like NAFTA? For example, will are people studying for jobs that could be outsourced? Or additionally, um, could they be um, looking for jobs that will not pay enough money to uh, pay for college? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the NAFTA angle on this is if the labor chapter works and is enforceable, if the $16 minimum wage rule of origin is effective, a lot of ifs, over time we could see an increased wage level in North America. And if the enforcement of the labor chapter, again, an if, is achieved, people in Mexico could now for for – finally organized to raise wages there. However, and that would have the effect I described vis-a-vis the United States. However, 
the issue that you point out is one that is worth flagging in that even if we get the right fixes to this NAFTA, our fight not just on trade but for economic justice is one that requires other components. So, of course, we have to get the NAFTA damage stopped. It's ongoing. Of course, we need to create the right new model and keep fighting over and over until it's what we want. But, obviously, the China trade issues, the global race to the bottom is very real. And domestically, our education, the, the training and education available to young people as they enter the job world, our vocational training system for workers who are transitioning, our systems of support for workers between jobs. All of these programs, our, our real lack of a serious apprenticeship program in this country, we could learn a lot of lessons from how worker education is conducted, for instance, in Germany. There are a lot of papers written about that. But getting the trade stuff right is a part of a bigger picture that also includes fixing the extremely unfair tax regime that Trump scammed us all with, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from yeah. area code 617. Go ahead. Yes. Um, could you remind us of some of the prominent Democrats you speak of who uh, have basically the wrong position on NAFTA? And also, this is calling from Boston. I, I think our congressional delegation is fairly good on this issue. I know we've lobbied them on TPP, among other things. <clears throat> but uh, I know you're up to date on this stuff. Is there any uh, of our congressional delegation, is there anyone who you think, shall we say, deserves some extra encouragement? <laughs> well, you actually are on ground zero for what could be the chairman of the Ways and Means, the Committee that has jurisdiction over trade. Congressman Richie Neal is your toughest customer in the state of Massachusetts vis-a-vis -vis trade. He is a guy whose natural instincts would put him in the camp of the flat-out bad guys. Um, his politics has kept him with the rest of the Democrats voting the right way when he has to. But he is one of those Democrats who, for instance, was in the minority of the, of the caucus and voted for the Korea agreement when the majority opposed it, but a bloc voted for it. He is a guy who um, is going to need a lot of extra oversight and care working with your partners in labor um, because he, he does have relationships with the local labor folks and with the state-level labor folks, but he's going to be a very powerful player. Excuse me while I remove this squeaky toy from the jaws of the dog so it does not destroy the entire call. Um, he is going to be an incredibly important player going forward because he is very likely, if the Democrats take a majority in the House, he will be the chairman of the committee handling NAFTA next year. Also, somewhat tricky um, is, uh, um, oh my gosh, I'm having a mental block. North Seth Shore, Moulton, Route perhaps. 1, second term member. Seth Moulton. Thank you very much. Seth Moulton. All I can think of is John Tierney. Seth Moulton. Seth Moulton is also a guy whose sensibility on trade is not in the right place. He's another guy who follows along politically but he has also been a very difficult customer on these issues. <clears throat> and Sandra Warren is one of the great champions on these issues and has been a total rock star, basically getting the rest of the Democrats in Congress to understand and be on the war path against ISDS. Mm -hmm. right. We're, we're going to be able to take about two more questions, because so, it's really we're getting on in time and we still have another speaker. Okay, okay. Our next question is from Victor. Victor, go ahead. Yes, uh, from Ithaca, New York. I was trying to type and keep up with you early on in your uh, talk. You referred to NAFTA and neoliberalism, and I think you used the phrase super attack. Is, is the establishment waging some, a kind of civil war on the American people and the, and the pro TPP, NAFTA, rank and file Democrats that are, you know, all cheering Obama and, and really wishing we'd go back to that sort of thing. Are they are they 
kind of useful idiots to a, an unprecedented corporate power grab under the guise of free trade agreements and, and globalization? Well, I would agree 100% with at least half of that statement, which is to say you've hit the nail on the head where the trade agreements are like some kind of a Trojan horse mechanism where everyone has been taught trade agreements, good, trade expansion, yay. And then, like the mythical Trojan horse, these things branded trade agreements are actually stuffed with an entire agenda, most of which has nothing to do with trade. So, you know, free trade agreement shouldn't have monopoly protectionism for big pharmaceutical companies. A patent is the classic definition of a rent-seeking monopoly tool. So you have basically the companies that had the role as advisors stuffing into this thing painted with a sign on the outside, free trade agreement, all kinds of protections and thumb-in-the-scale subsidies for basically their vision of a corporatist global governance system. And the TPP fight woke up a lot of people to that reality. That was a transformational fight. Everyone on this call who is involved in that, you know, a lot of people, we've all had this experience, finally said, oh, my God, I finally understand why you're so obsessed with those trade agreements. Jeez, it doesn't have to do with trade. And what we in part need to do right now in not throwing out the baby in the bathwater of our anti-Trump sentiments, is to get people focused on what the actual terms of the agreement are. So it's not slogans like, Trump, he's an isolationist, he keeps breaking agreements, and then the folks who are in the pro-TPP camp lump into one constant phrase as the continuation of that sentence, he breaks international agreements, the Iran deal, the Paris Climate Agreement, TPP, and he could break NAFTA as if somehow the Iran deal and the Paris Climate Treaty are the same thing as neoliberal job-killing, environment-trashing, wage-crushing, democracy, suffocating, trade agreements. And that is the danger. Now, there is a hardcore camp of about 20 Democratic House members and about 11 Democratic senators who are just dreadful on these issues. They are corporate hacks on these issues, on many issues. Some of them basically should just change parties. However, the majority of the members of Congress either fully get it, the Democrats, either fully get it, and those are our activist, wonderful champions led by Rosa DeLauro in the House, and led by Sherrod Brown and Senator Merkley from Oregon and Senator Warren and Senator Sanders in the Senate, either they are a leader like that or they get the point, especially after TPP, about what's afoot. The problem is in this Trump era where 98% of everything, and I'm going to put the 2% as NAFTA, 98% of everything that's come on this administration has been horrific. I can't even think of the right word. People are very easily put into a reflexive anti-Trump mode. And so our work needs to be to make sure that that reaction doesn't end up making people basically willing or unwilling pawns in what certainly is a corporate ploy to do a broad brush attack of making the hatred of Trump include the hatred of changing trade. And to just make a very specific example of this, the Koch brothers have a multi-million dollar advertising and organizing and roadshow tour and social media and PR campaign that they launched at the beginning of this year to defend the trade status quo. And one of their three things is to save NAFTA. And they are basically horrifically successful. They got the Democratic whip, Steny Hoyer, the third most senior, second most senior Democrat in the House, basically sending around social media things that they had, memes that they had put together about the steel tariffs the day they were announced. 
I mean, it's, it's a really dangerous situation where everyone wants to jump on the we hate Trump because who doesn't bandwagon and end up getting dragged into the broad brush. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more. I'm opening the line. Adam, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so my question is, I'm wondering if there's any possibility for us to uh, needle Trump and appeal to his ego about the fact that basically his plan to torpedo NAFTA and Chorus was effectively uh, sabotaged by an agent of uh, Goldman Sachs and the Kochs and to get him to sort of get his back up and uh, go back to his initial plans and uh, to be the actual decider in his administration, not people pulling papers off his desk. (laughs) I don't know if we want him to be more of a decider than he already is as a general matter. (laughs) Um, I I think that, um, I think, well, first of all, uh, well, too too much detail for this call, but I think that some of those stories are slightly exaggerated, Um, having some sense of what the whole dynamic there was about those various notices. But, I think it is the case that if if there is no enforcement of the labor chapter so that we end up with a deal that wouldn't really make a difference, then we have to think about some way to harvest the progress made in ISDS and harvest the progress on getting rid of the outrageous natural resources language and harvest the progress about the idea of the rule of origin with a wage standard, but then our better scenario would be, again, not judging this outcome, but if our friends in labor say that amazing language has not been made enforceable, then our better outcome may well be, it certainly will be for public citizen, the no NAFTA scenario. But that is a, that is a scenario we can think about strategizing around um, down the road, I think, our, I think our work now is to educate other people about what's really at stake, to get them focused on what actually is in the agreement, and then for us to fight, to push, to get the things we don't like when we see the text to be improved. Some of them can be improved like the labor enforcement and the implementing legislation. Other pieces of it may need changes in the agreement. I mean, who knows what happens if the Democrats have the House? We saw during George Bush number two's negotiations at a certain point, he finished agreements. They weren't agreements that could get through the Democratic House. Um, a totally pathetic deal, which some of you will know, nicknamed the May 10th deal, was made to change some of those agreements, Peru and Colombia, those changes There were some good changes in intellectual property, but the other changes were pretty feckless. But you could have a scenario where maybe the Democrats say, yeah, we like the labor standards with the implementing legislation and we like the no ISDS, but can't live with that 10-year biologics exclusivity and these other three things either. And then we all as activists may be in a fight at that point pushing for those changes. In the interim, and this gets back to why I said that we need to keep saying, even as we point out the improvements, we need to keep reiterating what isn't in there. I mean, what year are we in that we have a trade agreement that's going to be silent on climate? Like, you know, WTF. We have to put that in our statements. So in my statement that I've been drafting of laying out the important things that have gotten better, I've also laid out the things that are simply unacceptable going forward in in another kind of agreement. And if the labor standards aren't enforceable, well, it may be that ultimately the way we balance the whole thing is to say, yep, the whole package on net is not something that's going to stop the ongoing damage, and here's the stuff we need to have in any trade agreement going forward. If on net the labor stuff gets enforceable, it's a package that's worth fighting for and harvesting those changes, then still the statement would be, this is an important step in the right direction. However, the following things, that same set of language that would be in the other statement, must be in any trade agreement going forward. And that's the fight I think we have to line up. And I think Congress, and particularly Democrats in Congress, 
are a key target for that. Now, obviously, if you do electoral work, and I don't, public citizen doesn't, big disclaimer, I am in my house, in my kitchen, talking to you on my free time. So as not public citizen, but this is a civilian, if you do election work, this is the time to go to incoming members of the House and the Senate and to pin them down to bird dogging to get them to tell you that they would not accept a NAFTA replacement deal unless it gets rid of ISDS, puts in labor standards, subject to swift and certain enforcement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you go to our website, there is a two-pager that lays out in bullets that set of demands that have to be in a good trade agreement. Again, this NAFTA replacement is not going to tick all those boxes. The question is, on net, is it going to stop the damage? But we need to keep repeating and pushing for and in insisting our members of Congress sign up for and talk about that full set of changes. Great. Thank you so much, Thank Laurie. You. It, was, it was really terrific. Such an honor to have you speak. And uh, we definitely uh, appreciate and we, we really need your expertise. And uh, we appreciate your coming on since we know you're so swamped. And we're going to have to move on to our next speaker. If uh, you want, you can um, maybe join in the chat box if, any, if you're able. Maybe somebody has a question you can answer in there. Thank you so you much. And I'm going to listen to Ben because he is a former colleague. He worked at Global Trade Watch, a super smart guy, a great activist. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to enjoy what he has to say. Great. Thanks, Lori. And uh, we are very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Ben Beachy. He is the director of Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Program, and he has worked on trade policy for numerous years in a number of organizations, and uh, that includes fighting for workers' rights, climate justice, public health, and the rights of communities to self-determination. In 2015, uh, Ben joined the Sierra Club as Senior Policy Advisor to help fight the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And in this position with Sierra Club, Ben Vici investigates the implications of U.S. trade policy on environmental protections, and that includes efforts to combat climate change. He also advocates for Im immigrant rights, as a lot of us are aware. Previously, um, as uh, Lori indicated, Ben was the research director for Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, and as a D and he was also a DC-based national organizer for Witness for Peace. Ben's published articles have focused on post-food crisis trade policy, the impacts of U.S. and IMF policies in Latin America, and alternative economic indicators to supplement. GDP. Mr. Beachy re received a Bachelor's of, in Arts from Goshen College and a Master's in Public Policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Welcome, Ben. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, you sound great. Great. Okay, so Yes, as Lori mentioned, this is a very uh, timely uh, conversation, uh, given that the long-awaited NAFTA text is about to be unveiled, uh, letting us see what has been proposed in our name uh, behind closed doors. Um, so, you know, Sarah Club is <clears throat> the nation's largest and oldest environmental organization. So we've got a lot of fights on our hands right now under this administration on everything being rolled back on or attempted to be rolled back on in environmental protection, climate change, et cetera. Why would we choose one more fight? Why would we choose to work on trade? Uh, we didn't. Um, trade chose to work on us. Um, and, you know, Lori mentioned, actually concluded with this, um, you know, I think most people on this call are aware that trade is not really about trade. Trade deals are uh, hundreds of pages long, thousands of pages long, in the case of uh, some... Can you hear me? Yep, you, we hear you. Even okay, there sorry. Is something I hear someone else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and they, you know, these rules that are written into our current trade agreements they have a wide range of impacts on everything from the quality of your air to the stability of your jobs, the cost of your medicines, the safety of your food. Um, and um, so, next slide. That really begs the question of, you know, who is writing these rules? 
And I think it's important just to start with that focus of like, you know, who wrote NASA's rules um, for those who are not already aware, and who has been determining what will be included and excluded in a NASA 2.0 that's about to be unveiled. So here you see um, who has been writing the rules. There's an official system in the United States of trade advisors who get privileged access to uh, U.S. proposals that are secret to the rest of us for trade deals, um, and privileged access to trade negotiators. And lo and behold, 85% of those people um, who are official trade advisors and get to see the text explicitly represent corporations. Uh, here are the logos of a few of the ones that are uh, <coughs> represented. Um, you know, you have major agribusiness like Cargill, you have the, the Wall Street banks, you have um, a, a number of corporate polluters like Halliburton, Dow, uh, Chevron. So it maybe is not a big surprise that um, trade deals like NAFTA uh, end up looking like a grab bag of corporate handouts. That's because they were actually forged by the corporations themselves. So how could we fix this in replacing NAFTA or, or any trade deal? Um, what could we do? What kind of process could we have? What we've all been calling for is, of course, for trade policies to be crafted just like any other policies through an open and democratic process. I mean, we wouldn't allow our domestic policies impacting our jobs, our water, our medicines to be conducted completely in secret, um, where we're only allowed to see the final product after it's too late to change anything. Why should we allow trade deals that have the same exact impact um, to be conducted in secret? Um, so that means giving input on what proposals should be put forward, being able to see the text so the public uh, can help shape what's in the deal. The question is, is that how the NAFTA 2.0 negotiation has gone? Has it followed a more open and democratic process? Unfortunately, no. This is a slide showing a screenshot um, as of last Friday of the folks who are, are the trade advisors for the energy uh, portions of NAFTA 2.0. Um, these are the people who um, have been invited to uh, see the text and give their input um, while the rest of us have been shut out. Um, so you may know that energy has something to do with environmental protection. Uh, you don't see any environmental protection groups represented here. In fact, you don't see any groups represented at all besides corporations. And what kinds of corporations do you see that are now helping to determine the energy provisions of NAFTA 2.0? There's the Chevron Corporation, um, which uh, reports have shown have, uh, the largest climate polluter in history. Uh, Halliburton, which pioneered the practice of fracking. Um, the American Petroleum Institute, which represents big oil and big gas, and the National Mining Association, which represents big coal. These are the people who have gotten to decide whether NAFTA 2.0 should support fossil fuel dependency or a clean energy economy. You can guess which way they might have leaned on that question. So, but what if we, I think it's worth pausing for a second, saying what if we, you know, the public, everyone on this call, um, those of us who, you know, helped kill the TPP, what if we could help write the rules of trade? What would those rules look like? And this is not a rhetorical question. Many of us have been answering that question over the years and writing detailed proposals for what NAFTA's replacement should look like um, from an environmental or family farmer, or consumer, or labor perspective. Here are some reports Lori's written, that I've written, that our colleagues in labor and family farmer movement have written. These are like gold standard proposals. There's a common thread that runs throughout them. Replace corporate protections with protections for people and planet. These are how we would design optimal trade agreements that support workers, immigrants, family farmers, and our air, water, and climate. And we stand by these proposals and will continue to fight for them in trade agreements long after Donald Trump leaves office. But as Lori mentioned, that's not exactly how we're evaluating whether or not we should support or oppose NAFTA 2.0, because we already have NAFTA 1.0. And so the question for NAFTA right now, the NAFTA renegotiation, is not, does NAFTA 2.0 meet our gold standard? It says NAFTA 2.0 meet a do no harm standard. Does it eliminate NAFTA's existing threats to people and planet? And if so, then, uh, then we wouldn't necessarily oppose it, oppose it, even if it falls short of our deal. We have to do an honest assessment of does it eliminate the threats, does it do no harm? So next slide. What is our do no harm standard? What is the minimum criteria that NAFTA 2.0 must meet to eliminate NAFTA's damage? What is our yardstick for measuring the contents of the deal that comes out in, as, you know, in the next week? So I'm going to address this question, uh, the, really the critical question, from an environmental perspective. Before the NAFTA negotiations began, leading U.S. environmental groups got together and we put out some goals for NAFTA negotiations. 
And then this past May, it was about a year later, it was pretty apparent that the negotiations were not going our way. They were not attempting to achieve our goals, and they were going against our goals. So we decided to reiterate a baseline set of environmental criteria for assessing NAFTA 2.0. Collectively, the groups that you see at the top of the screen, representing most of the environmental, much of the environmental community in the United States, we decided to make clear that uh, the environmental community, most of the environmental community will oppose NAFTA 2.0 if, like NAFTA 1.0, it threatens the air, water, and climate of North America's communities. To spell out exactly what we mean, we specified some changes that must be made to meet this minimum benchmark to eliminate the damage uh, from NAFTA 1.0. And they boil down to three essential fixes to NAFTA that I'll highlight. So the first fix was to stop the outsourcing of pollution and jobs that NAFTA has promoted. Um, you know, Lori mentioned how lower labor standards and lower wages have enabled this. Also, lower environmental standards allow for this, making it easier for corporations. NAFTA has made it easier for corporations in the United States to simply move to Mexico, where environmental standards are weaker. And that, this right here is the fundamental inequity at the heart of NAFTA. The deal offers protections to corporations that cross borders without requiring cross-border protections of workers and the environment. So the fix is you know, clear from the get-go. We've been saying we need strong, binding environmental and labor standards across borders with certain enforcement. And from what we know, it looks like the NAFTA text that uh, will be coming out in the next week will fail in this regard as it comes in terms of environmental protection and fail pretty large. Um, I'll go through some examples. It, to see why this matters, it, it's helpful to use a very concrete example, and it has to do uh, with the battery in your car. U.S. factories used to recycle used car batteries uh, that contain lead, which is, of course, toxic to humans. In 2009, after fighting for years, many of us, uh, we got the United States to enact hard-fought protections against lead pollution, requiring corporations to clean up their act in the United States to protect our, com our communities from lead poisoning. But the corporations that were recycling lead batteries, your used car batteries, decided that instead of cleaning up U.S. battery recycling, they'd simply export their toxic batteries to Mexico, where lead standards are 10 times weaker. NAFTA lets them do this free of charge. NAFTA eliminated the 15% tariff that previously had been imposed on the export of lead acid batteries to Mexico without requiring Mexico to bring its lead standards up to U.S. levels. So they were able to export them to Mexico where lead standards are 10 times weaker and immediately after the enactment of our new protection in the United States, that's exactly what we saw. Lead battery exports to Mexico spiked, and over the next six years, those exports quadrupled. Go ahead, next slide. Oh. So for U.S. workers, this has meant lost jobs. As, you know, battery recycling plants across the country have, have been closing. Today, there are only eight such companies left in the United States. Eight. That's a lot of workers who have lost their jobs due to this outsourcing of, of pollution and jobs. Next slide. Meanwhile, Mexican communities are now importing our lead pollution. In 2010, more than six metric tons of lead were reportedly released into the air at just one of the plants in northern Mexico that is processing the flood of imported lead from our batteries under NAFTA. By comparison, that's 33 times the amount of lead that a battery processing plant owned by the very same company in South Carolina is emitting. 33 times, just the same company, different lead plant, one's in Mexico, one's in South Carolina. So in the Mexican communities that are now processing our used lead batteries, there are increasing reports of learning disabilities, kidney damage, and other symptoms of lead poisoning. What, there have been a number of studies on this. One recent one finds that the boom in lead battery in exports to Mexico under NAFTA is causing babies in communities in northern Mexico to be underweight with high levels of lead in their blood. So the, the effect of the outsourcing of pollution, this race to the bottom in environmental standards, is far from hypothetical. Children in northern Mexico today quite literally have lead in their blood due to the race to the bottom that NAFTA has enabled. Next slide. 
And this, I want to pause here because this really shows just how backwards Trump is on trade. You know, Lori mentioned this as well. Trump's whole message is, you know, it's, it's all about, NAFTA is all about U.S. versus Mexico. Well, who has been winning here? In this lead example, you know, the U.S. exported jobs. We lost jobs. We're certainly not winning. Mexico, in the meantime, imported our lead pollution. Communities on both sides of the border have been hurt by NAFTA so that a few CEOs could save a buck. And this is what Trump gets so wrong about trade. It's not about the U.S. versus Mexico. It's about corporations versus the rest of us. Next slide. It's not just lead pollution that gets offshored or outsourced when in this race to the bottom enabled by NAFTA. It's also climate pollution. It was just a few weeks ago this month that a New York Times article came out talking about a new report um, that finds that the U.S. is by far the world's largest outsourcer of, lead, cli of climate pollution. Uh, corporations have been evading our clean energy policies, as it turns out, by doing the same thing that they did with lead, taking advantage of trade deals to shift their climate pollution to countries with weaker standards, and that includes Mexico. The report shows that after over two decades of NAFTA, we are importing from Mexico goods that used to be made here but that are now made in Mexico with significant climate pollution. For example, cement. This is a picture of a cement factory in Mexico that's emitting a high degree of climate pollution. This climate pollution loophole produces the same result that we saw with lead. U.S. jobs are lost. Mexico imports our pollution. And our hard-fought climate protections are negated. I mean, if we pass policies to restrict climate pollution in Michigan, but then corporations simply shift their climate pollution to Monterey, Mexico, it doesn't matter. The, the atmosphere doesn't care where those emissions came from. It still causes climate change. So next slide. So this is why, you know, our trade deals are actually, in fact, climate deals. That is, as currently written, deals like NAFTA offer corporations a way to evade our climate policies. So they're not framed as climate deals, but they are climate deals. They're just deregulatory climate deals. Trade deals like NAFTA that fail to include climate standards, they're not simply ignoring the climate crisis. They are actively contributing to it. How do we fix this? How do we close the pollution offshoring loophole in NAFTA? We've made that clear from the get-go. NAFTA's replacement must include strong environmental and labor standards with certain enforcement. If a trade deal allows corporations to cross borders, it also must ensure cross-border protections for workers and communities. We've been saying from the beginning that NAFTA's replacement should require each country to enforce robust climate, air, and water, labor, and human rights protections in line with our core international agreements. Now, it might not surprise you that that's not exactly what we expect to see in a NAFTA 2.0 negotiated by the climate-denying Trump administration. The deal to be unveiled soon will almost certainly not have binding climate standards to cross borders. It may not even mention climate change, which is, uh, by the way, just like the TPP. TPP had uh, about 6,000 pages of text and failed to mention climate change once. And when the TPP text came out, that's exactly what we said. We said, this is a climate-denying deal. And it looks like that may be the same headline after the NAFTA 2.0 text is revealed. The deal may include other pollution standards or you know, protections for wildlife, but the important thing will be what words are actually used. You know, the rumor is that it will be much like the TPP's weak words. The TPP said things like, you know, countries should, as appropriate, endeavor to protect sharks or halt lead pollution. These are words that are basically devoid of legal meaning. Their purpose is to greenwash NAFTA 2.0, not undo NAFTA's damage. Even if we do see stronger standards in some areas, the big question is going to be, as Lori mentioned, you know, how will these be enforced? It's the same question that our brothers and sisters in the labor movement are asking. The enforcement system for the last four trade deals of the United States has categorically failed when it comes to the environmental protection. Not a single case has been brought against a single country for widely documented environmental violations. This is, a, again, a, just a track record of zero. And the, record, the rumor is that the enforcement mechanism in the text that is about to be unveiled would be more of the same, just like the TPP, at least when it comes to the environmental protection enforcement. 
So the second essential fix that we, the, a bunch of environmental groups, have outlined to undo NAFTA's damage uh, to our air, water, and climate is to shield environmental policies from industry interference. And here, clearly, one of the biggest ways that NAFTA allows industry interference is ISDS, as uh, Lori mentioned. And you know, there are, <clears throat> are reports, as Lori talked about, that we are likely to see an important step forward in ISDS, but also, unfortunately, an important step backward when it comes to environmental protection. Next slide. So Lori already gave a thorough overview of you know, ISDS and why this private legal system for corporations is so egregious. So I, given the time, I won't repeat the details. Suffice it to say that the system has been used by corporate polluters time and again to attack a host of environmental policies. I think most people on the line know this. And the solution here is pretty simple. Eliminate ISDS, period. Corporations should get the same basic rights that they get under domestic law enforceable in domestic courts. Next slide. As Lori described, the movement against ISDS has made you know, significant gains here. Um, you know, around the world, actually, the movement against ISDS has been convincing multiple governments to eliminate ISDS entirely. So now the fact that the NAFTA 2.0 text is slated to at least curtail the broad rights that NAFTA gives to corporations through the ISDS system, that should be seen as a further sign that our movement against ISDS has momentum, which is great. Next slide. Unfortunately, this progress comes with a, a significant exception. The NAFTA 2.0 text is expected to say, we're going to curtail the broad NAFTA rights that corporations have used to attack environmental protection, except for one group of corporations, which happens to include the largest corporate polluters in history. U.S. oil and gas corporations doing business in Mexico would have access to the same broad rights that have given rise to repeated ISDS attacks on air, water, and climate protections brought by those very same corporations. This includes Chevron and uh, ExxonMobil, which have offshore drilling contracts in Mexico. These two corporations have emitted more climate pollution than any other companies in the world. That's the, uh, the studies showing, quantifying the amount of climate pollution. These are the top two in the world. And they're the ones that will get access to these broad rights still. It's almost, you know, they're also the corporations that have already taken advantage of ISDS to successfully attack environmental policies from Canada to Ecuador. So it's almost laughably ironic that NAFTA 2.0 would include a special carve out for them, for oil and gas corporations, giving them and them alone access to the extreme rights that they have repeatedly used to attack environmental policies. It's kind of like saying, you know, from now on, we're going to protect the hen house but by keeping all animals away from the hens, except for foxes. They're cool. Next slide. <laughs> the third essential fix to NAFTA that we have boiled down as an environmental community is uh, that the deal must, any deal that replaces NAFTA, must support a clean energy economy, not fossil fuel dependency. I mean, to eliminate NAFTA's damage, we simply cannot shift to a clean energy future if a corporate trade deal like NAFTA or NAFTA 2.0 tethers us to the fossil fuel past. That's what NAFTA does. It includes a series of handouts to corporate polluters. So we hope to see at least one of these handouts to corporate polluters eliminated. But unfortunately, it looks like others' handouts to fossil fuel corporations will remain, and we may even see some new ones in NAFTA 2.0. Next slide. So one of these handouts to fossil fuel corporations is a rule in NAFTA uh, that bars the U.S. government from determining whether exports of gas to Mexico are in the public's interest. You know, for most uh, countries in the world, uh, environmental lawyers, such as those at Sierra Club and in a bunch of different environmental organizations, they have the opportunity to argue that exporting gas to the country, to another country, is not in the public's interest, given the impacts that more gas exports have on, uh, fr uh, on communities through increased fracking, increased gas pipelines, increased climate change. But NAFTA takes that tool away from us for gas exports to Mexico. It requires that all U.S. gas exports to Mexico must be automatically approved. Next slide. So this, this uh, rule has facilitated a five-fold increase in U.S. gas exports to Mexico since 2010. This surge in gas exports has fueled increased fracking in the U.S., 
and an expansion of cross-border gas pipelines. This here is a picture of members of the American Indian Movement protesting the building of the controversial Trans-Pecos Pipeline through Texas to export fracked gas from Texas to Mexico. NAFTA's lock-in of gas exports to Mexico has enabled such pipelines, but it's also contributed to increasing gas dependency in Mexico, which has crowded out the growth of solar and wind power. Right now, half of Mexico's electricity comes from gas. Only 1% comes from solar and wind. And data from the government of Mexico shows that the rising dependency on gas is the primary driver of that country's recent increase in climate pollution. Next slide. Lori mentioned another rule uh, known as the proportionality clause um, that is also a fossil fuel handout. Uh, it has a similar effect for tar sands oil in Canada as for gas in the United States. It essentially locks in tar sands oil extraction by requiring Canada to export much of that oil to the United States. And tar sands oil, for those who don't know, is one of the most climate polluting fuels in the world. This also gives a green light to banks you know, to continue financing extraction of tar sands. Um, it's a significant obstacle to Canada meeting its climate goals. Next slide. So the solution here is pretty simple. We should be using trade deals to incentivize production of goods that are good. If we want to promote public health, for example, we cannot afford trade deals that incentivize tobacco production. In the same way, if we want to transition to a clean energy economy, we cannot afford a NAFTA 2.0 that locks us into decades more of fossil fuel dependency. So all such handouts to fossil fuel corporations must be eliminated. Next slide. What do we expect to see when the tax is unveiled? It's looking like that rule that I mentioned that requires automatic approval of gas exports to Mexico is still going to be in there. We hear, as Lori mentioned, that the proportionality rule that locks in tar sands oil in Canada will no longer be there, which would be a bright spot in a deal that's otherwise looking pretty dim for our climate. It will also, though, at the same time, be watching for any new rules that could be inserted into NAFTA 2.0 that could make it more difficult to restrict fracking or offshore drilling in Mexico. The Trump administration has explicitly stated that they intend for NAFTA 2.0 to, quote, lock in the recent deregulation of oil and gas in Mexico, which is supporting increased offshore drilling right now and soon increased fracking. NAFTA 2.0 could protect these polluting activities if it includes a new rule that requires oil and gas deregulation to persist indefinitely, even as the climate crisis worsens and our demands for climate action grow. Next slide. So in short, you know, the plan for NAFTA 2.0, as far as we're aware from, um, from inside sources, is that it is not looking good from an environmental perspective. If the final text looks anything like what I've just reviewed, it will fall far short of the baseline criteria that the environmental community has outlined to eliminate NAFTA's existing damage to our communities. We cannot afford another binding trade pact that locks North America's communities into decades more of toxic pollution, job offshoring, and fossil fuel dependency. The good news, of course, is that we don't have to just accept whatever deal is in, unveiled in the next week. Any deal will have to be voted on in Congress, almost certainly the next Congress. So what can we do? We can tell Congress what we stand for. We can speak up to tell Congress how they should be evaluating the deal. You know, from day one, our broad coalition has been saying that any NAFTA replacement deal must include strong protections for workers and our air, water, and climate, not for corporate polluters. Now is a critical moment for all of us to tell our members of Congress uh, that message so they know how they should be evaluating the deal when it comes out. And so you can send them that message. Lori gave an you know, example from Public Citizen site. If you go to that website that's on the page there, you'll see Sierra Club's message to Congress. You can go to AFL-CIO or any of the groups that have been you know, fighting on NAFTA for over two decades now and find a message to Congress to say, here is how you should be evaluating the deal. Here's the yardstick that you should be using. And you need to speak up loudly. Next slide. When the text comes out, that's going to be a key moment for all of us and for our members of Congress to speak up indeed. We cannot afford to be silent in the months between now and any vote on an after 2.0 because we know that Donald Trump will not be silent. He will obviously be taking to Twitter to boast that he has sealed the best deal ever. And if the only thing the public hears about NAFTA 2.0 in the coming months is the sound of Donald Trump loudly patting himself on the back, 
we all lose. Instead of letting Donald Trump control the trade narrative, as Lori mentioned, it is the time right now for our broad movement to speak up. It's the time to use the yardsticks that we have laid out for NAFTA 2.0, such as the minimum environmental criteria I've gone over, to size up the deal and make clear how it measures up. To make clear that we stand for a pro-worker, pro-immigrant, pro-environment vision for trade, a vision that beats Trump's empty sales pitch. The coming months of debate over NAFTA 2.0 will be a battle for the hearts and minds of the U.S. public on what our trade policy should look like for the coming decades. And I think that's a battle worth fighting. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was really good. And um, so now if you have uh, questions for Ben, please press star six and the one, and you'll be entered into the queue. Thank you so much, Ben. This is Wendy Getz from Newton, New Jersey, NJ5. Um, I appreciate both of your discussions. They were amazing. Um, I'll venture to say this was the best trade call ever. Uh, I would like to ask a question and make a reference, kind of a heads up, to HR 4606. As Lori mentioned, um, a lot of these trade deals are going on what the U.S. laws are. And this bill is passed the House, I know because my terrible congressional representative voted for it, um, Ensuring Small-Scale LNG Certainty and Access Act. Um, along with you, uh, the methane is distributed in the jet stream, the Gulf Stream, and, and you know, creating havoc in the Arctic, but our U.S. laws are setting precedent for, you know, what's, what's being written, and we're watching the corporations write the laws and write these. But the bridge to the other side, which we're always looking for that educational bridge, as well as you agree with this, so listen to, you know, what we have presented as well. Um, is these are terrorist targets. These LNG uh, export stations, as we saw in Massachusetts, and I, it's just horrible that people have not connected the two as well as, you know, climate exasperation. So I appreciate your talk, and um, what is some language we can use, in your opinion, for that? I appreciate it. Thanks, Wendy. I mean, I think, yeah, it's a good question. And, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, there are various bills kind of floating around out there that would do the same thing that I mentioned for NAFTA, that would basically take away the autonomy for the United States government to determine whether or not um, more gas exports, more LNG export terminals, more fracking, more gas pipelines are in the public's interest. And, uh, you know, we uh, have been loudly <laughs> opposing um, this basically um, incursion on our policy autonomy. Uh, you know, we, I think you could, um, you can talk about this, as I mentioned, you know, as from a climate angle, because we certainly cannot um, be transitioning to a clean energy economy while binding ourselves to multi-decade binding trade packs like NAFTA and maybe like NAFTA 2.0, that say we cannot even decide whether or not to restrict gas exports. Um, that is certainly true from a climate angle. You could even step back and, and for those, you know, want to use a different angle, say just in the, as an argument for like from a standpoint of democracy, from policy space, shouldn't we um, be able to democratically determine um, uh, whether or not uh, we want to, whether for security reasons, for climate reasons, um, for local pollution reasons, um, or for, you know, in, indigenous groups uh, or the sovereignty over their own territory, there's a host of reasons that we may want to decide whether to say yes or to say no to more fracking, to more gas pipelines, to more LNG export terminals, and to more gas exports. Um, and the thing that these trade deals do is even take away that option to say yes or no from us. It automatically says yes from here on, binding for potentially decades, as long as we're talking about a country that signed a trade deal like NAFTA with the United States. Thank you. I agree. I brought that up with my freeholders, and I went and protested public testimony for every LNG 
possibility here, but I, I see the attack coming again, and uh, it's a legislative attack and a community attack as well. So I, I thank you for your efforts, and I will continue to follow. Thank you, Wendy. Next speaker, uh, question, uh, Stephen? Yes, this is uh, Steve in Colorado. I would like to know if today's webinar will be available online for people to look at who weren't part of the yes. call, and if so, how yes. soon? Yes, yes we, um, we uh, usually carry mixes, the audio and the visuals, and we try to get it out, um, barring any unforeseen technical difficulties within the week. So hopefully, probably towards the end of the week. And, uh, so what website would I, people go to? I, I, for, I send it out through my trade justice list, and I also post it on our uh, Facebook group, which is Trade Justice Alliance. You can join our Facebook group. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, Ben. Uh, Paul Flaver from Rats, New York. Um, Hi, Paul. In 2016, uh, Michael, what's what, what's the name of the executive director for Sierra Club? I forget. Michael Bruin. Michael Bruin. Yeah, he he spoke to us all at the uh, members of the um, the trade justice um, listserv, and he said that sometimes the Sierra Club will endorse candidates, even candidates that might be in favor of trade policies, which we strongly object to. Because what that does is it still preserves a seat at the table. Given what Lori Welk has, has uh, warned us about in endorsing neoliberal Democrats, um, don't you think that's kind of a, a risky thing to do? Don't, don't you think that we would actually lose uh, our, our bargaining chip with organizations? And so that being said, is this still a policy that Michael Bruin endorses, or have you been reconsidering? So um, first of all, uh, as, as Lori said, um, I, I don't work on candidate issues. I'm not allowed to work on candidate issues I'm legally. Um, I'm also sitting in my home. But I would, I would say that, uh, so I can't speak with respect to what any particular endorsement of any particular candidate, what the decision might have been there. What I can say is what the policy of the Sierra Club is, is we have a bottom-up process for doing candidate endorsements. It's not one I'm part of, but the process really starts with our chapters. Um, Sierra Club has chapters all across the United States, um, and we take grassroots seriously. Um, we uh, ask our chapters to give uh, recommendations on who, who they would like to endorse, and they consider all the different issues that we work on. Uh, many of our chapters have fought very strongly to make sure that um, we keep endorsements off of um, those candidates who uh, are endorsing same old, same old NAFTA-style trade agreements. Um, at the same time, uh, neither Michael Bruhn nor myself control, uh, in the end, this exact list of candidates that we endorse. Um, that is a process led by those chapters. I would just say that it is something that um, – is risen uh, in quite a bit over the last 20 years in the priorities of the Sierra Club is trade, um, where we now you know, ha uh, help play a role in the environmental community of analyzing what uh, our, the impacts of our trade agreements would have on our core environmental priorities. And I would certainly you know, personally agree with you um, that we cannot um, just allow uh, our, our policymakers, our representatives, to get away with um, endorsing same old, same old trade and expecting that they're just going to have our support. I think that's really important um, for us to, uh, you know, to call them out and to say, um, like I concluded with, here's what you need to say. Um, here's the trade vision that we stand for. Uh, you need to make clear that you stand for an alternative trade vision that supports workers, immigrants, and our air, water, and climate. Um, and right now, more than ever, is the time for members of Congress to be saying that. I would say in this weird moment with Trumpism scrambling everything on trade, um, we should be at making that same ask to all members of Congress, regardless of who got whose endorsement, regardless of just how, which side of the establishment Democrat versus rising Democrat line they are on. All of them 
uh, Democrats and even Republicans should be hearing the message that we need to be, they need to be speaking out right now um, for the yardstick that they're going to be using on trade. Again, as I mentioned, if the only sound after the NAFTA text is revealed uh, is Donald Trump slapping himself on the back, the only writing is Donald Trump's tweets boasting that he sealed the best deal ever, then we all lose. So I think regardless of who your member of Congress is, it is important right now to be urging them to speak out and put forth their vision for what uh, needs to replace uh, NAFTA and that it be aligned with our vision of essentially stripping NAFTA of all of its protections for corporations and replacing them with protections for people and planet. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Ben. Um, and now uh, let's see. Okay, next question. Laura, Oh, Alan. It's from Alan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that was a very commendable talk, Ben. Um, I was wondering if you or Sierra Club has been talking with Jeffrey Sachs on any of that. Yeah, uh, we have. Um, I'm actually going to be at a conference with Jeffrey Sachs uh, in a week. I believe Lori is as well. Um, we're, you know, uh, yeah, Jeff Sachs has uh, spoken out a number of times um, on trade from a variety of different angles, and including on the climate angle. Um, you know, when we uh, at various points have uh, pointed out, for example, when we were analyzing the TPP and said, this is a deal that den by denying climate change will help fuel climate change. Um, we talk about the specific risks, many of which are the same ones that I've highlighted here for NAFTA. Um, Jeff uh, was outspoken in saying, yeah, we can, same thing. We cannot be talking about transitioning to a clean energy economy while uh, trade agreements uh, lock us into decades more fossil fuel dependency. Um, so he has, he has been uh, clear and outspoken on that message, which is, which is great. There is one thing I wanted to follow up on with that, and that is, have you ever discussed the possibility of getting 3% of the, of the population signed up for uh, understanding and implementing the, the Sustainable Development Goals and what kind of an impact it would have if we got 3% of the population signed up. Yeah, there's a you know there's a a, a movement uh, theory uh, that if you get you know three and a half percent of the population, I believe it is to uh, to agree with you, you yeah policy change is inevitable. Um, I think that'd be great, and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, would be a great rubric um, for orienting much of our policy, domestic policies, and our trade policies. I mean, yeah. our, our NAFTA and uh, and from the looks of it, a good chunk of NAFTA 2.0 is uh, at odds with what we've named as the Sustainable Development Goals, which include you know initiatives to combat climate change and, and economic inequity. Um, there's, you know, the trade deals at this point have been on exactly the opposite side of the ledger by fueling more inequity, by increasing environmental injustice, um, by increasing job uh, loss and low wages with disproportionate impacts for communities of color, working class families and immigrants. That's exactly the opposite of what the Sustainable Development Goals are all about. Um, so if we were to actually design our trade agreements to uh, be uh, targeting uh, and su supporting rather than undermining sustainable development goals, it would require a, a reorientation and a, a pretty fundamental reorientation of how we approach trade. Now he's teaching a class that I'm taking right now. And uh, I oh, would, cool. I'd really like to see if there's a way to get the Sierra Club brought into that process of doing outreach to make sure that we get three, perhaps 3.5 percent of the population signed up and, and tr taking the course on implementing the sustainable development goals. Because I think if we did, we would be able to cut through an awful lot of ideological chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that I, I support that. Feel free to reach out and like our, our local chapter in New York is probably the best one to reach out to about that. Okay, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. And uh, we have one more. Uh, Mara, your line's open. It's yep. Mara. I had Mara. muted myself in case I was bleeding through your mute. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you so much for being on. It's, it's spectacular. And uh, Alan, thank you for chiming in. And I, it's kind of, um, I had the question ahead of time, but it's kind of in response to both of those. Um, it seems to me that distance trade and large carrier trade is unsustainable. 
Um, I know this is a big subject, and I'm not going to try to get anybody to address it uh, writ large. But, um, and in my view, NAFTA, no matter what you do to it, as far as environmental justice and maintaining um, uh, uh, global community self-determination culture language, you know, counter-globalization trade, um, which to me is no distance trade and, and, and no large capacity vessel trade. And there's no sustainable environmental way to do it other way, otherwise as far as I've been able to analyze it. And I was wondering if you could just address that thought for a second then, or if you don't want to go into those weeds right now, that's fine. Yeah, sure. No, I could Thanks briefly more. address that. I mean, I think, I think it's a really important question of like, yeah, should we be, uh, I don't know if you know this, but like if, when you eat chicken wings, um, it's possible that those chicken wings came from chickens that were raised in the United States, then were shipped across mm-hmm. the Pacific Ocean once to go to China um, to be processed and chopped up and then brought back across the Pacific Ocean a second time to the United States to be sold to you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just one example. Basically, yeah. when you eat a chicken wing, it's possible it crossed the Pacific Ocean twice before it got to you. And the question yeah. is, is that really a sensible way of designing trade policy, uh, just writ large, much less a climate-sensible way of designing trade policy? Um, you know, I think one of the antidotes to this system is to have, by local policies, uh, by clean or by green policies in our, in our procurement so that our tax dollars are spent um, to you know, incentivize local businesses and to um, make sure that we buy uh, products that are both produced by locally and also produced under you know, conditions that um, support um, our climate goals rather than undermining them. An example of this, it's not a pipe dream, there's, you know, California um, just, I think it was last year, enacted a buy clean law. Um, Sierra Club's chapter and unions and environmental justice groups got together, passed this thing into law in the shadow of the Trump administration that says the state of California will now only spend taxpayer dollars on major infrastructure projects from companies that disclose their supply chain emissions and make wow. efforts to reduce them. And that's supply chain emissions, not their emissions in California. It's their emissions from the time you grow that chicken to the time it's a chicken wing, right? And so it is, uh, what that means is if they're prioritizing companies that have low supply chain emissions, in effect, that's going to create a bunch of jobs in California because those supply chains are going to be shorter. Um, and that is a great solution. It's kind of like the antidote to our current trade model. Um, unfortunately, you have to, uh, again, change our current trade model, which has a lot of rules about procurement that limit what governments can do. Um, so simultaneously, we need to be uh, revamping our trade model so to give governments the freedom to do, the autonomy to do what California has already done, this buy clean law. And, and at the same time, we need to be passing like a federal buy clean law in the United States so that we are uh, spending all of our taxpayer dollars um, on products that are um, made locally, that have low climate uh, pollution, that respect workers' rights um, and, and the rest. And so I think that's, that's an important twofer change the trade model, and change domestic policy so as to incentivize um, a more sensible uh, trading system. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Mara. Is there anybody else in the queue? Is, is Wendy, are you in the queue, Wendy? I am. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, definitely. My head is exploding. And uh, the last question answered a lot. Um, I don't know if Lori's still on, but... You know, with, with acts like the Cool Act, and she was explaining, as well as Ben, um, so question for either people, I'm looking for resources that, you know, directly relate to veterans and or disabled people so that we can build the conversation about how NAFTA affects them. And um, I'll just stop there because I have like 17 other ones, but <laughs> thank you so much. I think you touched on so much. One of my other, you know, thoughts was how can we um, propel the cleanup of what mess we've made? We have, you know, over 108 uh, Superfund sites in New Jersey, 
gosh knows how many landfills, but we could be turning a lot of that into gas and clean up the mess we've made while we go. I, I hear Lori. Lori is trying to break through here. <laughs> Lori? Hi. Sorry I double muted myself. <laughs> That's okay. So, Wendy, you want to ask your question again? No, I heard it. And I was, oh, okay, I'm, I'm still here. And I, um, the, the answer is with respect to veterans. The procurement, for instance, of medicines by the VA, the, the purchase of it is done under procurement. And so that actually isn't covered by those uh, problematic intellectual property rules um, in the same direct way. But if it's the law of the land, it's the law of the land. So it's, um, you know, the, the law of the land already is the 12-year biologics procurement, uh, sorry, biologics exclusivity. The, the one thing that's good news is pharma wanted to push into the NAFTA renegotiation language that actually the other countries' health advocates in TPP managed to get out, which was in the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, which would have made decisions by Medicare, Medicaid formularies of, you know, what medicines will be in, reimbursed by government health care programs. They wanted to make the, a, a new rule that required, basically would have just destroyed the ability to do bulk purchasing to get prices down. And um, some of the progressive champions in Congress, like Rosa DeLauro and Lloyd Doggett and Congresswoman Schakowsky from Illinois, they went nuts about that and got that taken out. So that, that, that is in some other U.S. agreements, but that's not going to be in the, the redone NAFTA deal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Wendy, did you have another, or is that for you? Uh, my congressman is, is Scott Heimer. Um, a, a, as a candidate, I have had to step away a little bit from pressuring him. I did see that he did sign on to one letter, but he has taken no action. Environmentally, he has, you know, somewhat of a decent voting record, but no action at all in our district. And uh, just to note, but not to diss at all, um, Sierra Club here did um, endorse him, although as a candidate I have not saw any endorsements at all because I just don't want to play any election games. I just want to stick to the issues, trade, health, environment. Right. And okay. I, I just, I, I guess any forward thoughts from either of you towards Congressman Gottheimer, uh, there will be no debates, as far as I'm aware of, but uh, I will be in a few seminars with him. You should corner him. He is a catastrophe on trade. He is one of the only. He's one of only four Democratic members of the 30-member House freshman class or 26-member House freshman class who refused, despite a huge pylon by all the unions to sign on to a letter that simply said NAFTA renegotiation should be good for people on the planet and in general terms talked about eliminating ISDS and adding labor standards. He is absolutely on the other side and um, is in that camp. Though he did not have the opportunity to take a position on TPP, he wasn't there. He is in that bucket of 20 deplorable trade members that I mentioned in the Democratic House caucus. I've plastered his walls, his doors, and I have called him out, and I have even had him run away from me. Um, Keep it up. And to no avail. That's why I'm running. (laughs) Keep it up. I'm running right after him for Congress. (laughs) Good Good to you. Great. Yeah, and folks, great. I now okay. do have to actually jump out off. I'm so yep. sorry. I have a radio show coming thank you. in. So thank, thank you, Lori. you all so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, we was just wonderful your presentation, and we so appreciate all the work you do for climate, for the environment, and also for your work on immigrant rights. Um, you're really an inspiration to all of us. So thank you so much. Let's yeah, no, thank you so much for your leadership and, and hosting this call all the time. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's such a crucial time to be talking about this, so I appreciate that everyone's yeah, got such a sustained your, interest in it. You know, all the, 
all the tips we can get now because it's so hard to organize around trade right now. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. All right. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. I forgot to move that thing forward. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to mention that we will be sending out the video of the presentation uh, later this week. As I mentioned before, uh, Carrie mixes the audio and the visuals. And just so you know, also you can also access all of our other videos that have been produced by Carrie. Uh, she takes the audio and visuals, and you can get those at tradejustice.net forward slash webinar vids, V-I-D-S, and you can access all of them there. We, we really think Carrie's terrific for the work she does on our, on our uh, stuff like that. So also, um, we could use your help. If you, uh, we would love it if you would uh, love to work with us. We have a planning call on Wednesday nights. It is 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, if you would like to volunteer, there are lots of roles to be filled. Um, some are, you know, uh, they, they may seem mundane, but they're all very necessary. We could use help with recruitment on posting events on social media, um, ideas for speakers and topics. You can help us plan and organize and run our webinars. And um, you can do, uh, as I said, speaker outreach. And if you're interested in joining, you can email me, harriet at tradejustice.net. And let's see, oops, that was it. Last but not least, if you are so inclined, we would welcome a small donation and uh, just a few dollars, nothing major. And to make a small donation, go to tradejustice.net forward slash TJA donate and just drop a few dollars, and I mean a few, into the kitty, nothing major. Um, and finally, we want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We, we realize that there are lots of other places that you could be on your Sunday night. And uh, even if you're not trade junkies like us, uh, we're very grateful and honored that you chose to spend your time with us. Thank you all so much and have a good night from the trade justice team. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank yeah. you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Mara, for awesome. all your help. Thank you, help. Harriet. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, 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 gals. Bye, bye everybody. everybody. Thank you, you. Harriet. Thank, Thank you, Mara. You. Thanks, everyone. Take care.